Good afternoon, gentle listeners. It's Erin, your librarian storyteller for the day. Welcome to Sherlock Showcase, dedicated to retelling the very best of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's most beloved detective, Sherlock Holmes, in short story format. Today we'll be picking up where we left off with the second to last story of Doyle's first anthology, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, with a retelling of The Adventure of the Barrel Coronet. So relax, pull up a chair, Please be, bear with my questionable English accent, if you would, and enjoy. Holmes, said I, as I stood one morning in our bow window looking down upon the street, here's a madman coming along. It seems rather sad that his relative should allow him to come out alone. My friend ra- rose lazily from his armchair and stood with his hands in the pockets of his dressing gown, looking over my shoulder. It was a bright, crisp February morning, and the snow of the day before still lay deep upon the ground, shimmering brightly in the wintry sun. Down the centre of Baker Street it had been ploughed into a brown crumbly band by the traffic, but at either side and on the heaped-up edges of the footpaths it still lay as white as when it fell. The grey pavement had been cleaned and scraped, but it was still dangerously slippery, so that there were fewer passengers than than usual. Indeed, from the direction of the Metropolitan station no one was coming save the single gentleman whose erratic conduct had drawn my attention he was a man of about fifty tall portly and imposing with a massive strongly marked face and a commanding figure he was dressed in a sombre yet rich style in black frock coat shining hat neat brown gaiters and well-cut pearl grey trousers yet his actions were in absurd contrast to the dignity of his dress and features for he was running hard with an occasional little springs, such as a wary man who gives what is less accustomed to set any tax upon his legs. As he ran, he jerked his hands up and down, waggling his head, and writhed his face into the most extraordinary contortions. What on earth can be the matter with him? I asked. He is looking up at the numbers of the houses. I believe he is coming here, said Holmes, rubbing his hands. Here? Yes, I rather think he is coming to conduct me professionally. I think that I recognize the symptoms. (laughs) Did I not tell you? As he spoke, the man puffing and blowing rushed at our door and pulled on our bell until the whole house responded with clanging. A few moments later, he was in our room, still puffing, still gesticulating, but with so fixed a look of grief and despair in his eyes that our smiles were turned in an instant to horror and pity. For a while he could not get his words out, but swayed his body and plucked at his hair like one who had been driven to the extremes of his extreme limits of his reason. Then, suddenly springing to his feet, he beat his head against the wall with such force that we both rushed upon him and tore him away to the centre of the room. Sherlock Holmes pushed him down into the easy chair, and sitting beside him, patted his hand and chatted with him in the easy, soothing tones which he knew so well how to employ. "'You have come to me to tell me me your story, have you not?' "'You have come to me to tell me your story, have you not?' said he. "'You are fatigued with your haste.' Pray wait until you have recovered yourself, and then I shall be most happy to look into any problem which you may submit to me. The man sat for a minute or more with a heaving chest, fighting his emotion. Then he passed his handkerchief over his brow, set his lips tight, and turned his face toward him, towards us. <laughs> no doubt you think me mad, said he. I see that you have some great trouble, responded Holmes. God knows I have, a trouble which is enough to unseat my reason so sudden and terrible it is. Public disgrace I might have faced, although I am a man whose character has never yet borne a stain. Private affliction also is the lot of every man, but the two coming together, and in so frightful a form, have been enough to shake my very soul. Besides, it is not I alone. The very noblest in this land may suffer unless some way must be found out of this horror, horrible affair. Pray compose yourself, sir, said Holmes, and let, us ha- have, let me have a clear account of who you are and what it is that has befallen you. "'My name,' answered our visitor, "'it's probably familiar to your ears. "'I am Alexander Holder, "'of the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson "'on Thread- Threadneedle Street.' "'The name was indeed well known to us "'as belonging to the senior partner "'in the second largest private banking concern "'in the City of London. "'What could have happened then "'to bring one of the foremost citizens of London "'to this most pitiable pass? "'We waited, all curiosity, "'until with another effort "'he braced himself to tell his story.' "'I feel that time is of value,' said he. "'That is why I have hastened here when the police inspector suggested that I should secure your cooperation. "'I came to Baker Street by the underground and hurried from there on foot, for the cabs go slowly through the snow. 
That is why I was so out of breath, for I am a man who takes very little exercise. I feel better now, and I will put the facts before you so shortly and yet as clearly as I can. It is, of course, very well known to you that in such a successful banking business as much depends upon our being able to find remunerative investments for our funds as upon our increasing our connection and number of our d depositors. One of our most lucrative means of laying out his money is in the shapes of loans, where the security is unimpeachable. We have done a good deal in this direction during our last few years, and there have been many noble families to whom we have advanced large sums upon the security of their pictures, library, or a plate. Yesterday morning I was seated in my office at the bank with a, when a card was brought in to me by one of the clerks. I startled when I saw the name, for it was none other than, well, perhaps even to you I had better say no more other than it was a name which is a household name all over the earth, one of the highest, noblest, most exalted names in England. I was overwhelmed by the honour and attempted, when he entered, to say so, but he plunged, as, plunged at once into business with the air of a man who wishes to her through a dis disagreeable mad task. "'Mr. Holder,' said he, "'I have been informed that you are in the habit of advancing money.' "'The firm does so when the security is good,' I answered. "'It is absolutely essential to me,' said he, "'that I shall have fifty thousand pounds at once.' I could, of course, borrow so trifling a matter ten times over from my friends, but I much prefer to make it in a matter of business, and to carry out that business myself. In my position, you can readily understand that it is unwise to place oneself under obligations. For how long, may I ask, do you want the sum? I asked. Next Monday I have a large sum due to me, and I shall then most certainly repay you what you advance, with what in whatever interest you think is right to charge. But it is essential to me... Uh, the money should be paid at once. I should be happy to advance it without further parley from my own private purse, said I, were it not that the strain would be rather more than I could bear. If, on the other hand, I am to do it in the name of the firm, then in justice to my partner, I must insist that, even in your case, even every business-like precaution should be taken. I should very much prefer to have it so, he said, rising up a square, black Morocco case which he had laid beside his chair. You have doubtless heard of the barrel coronet, one of the most precious public possessions of the empire, said I. Precisely. He opened the case then, and there, embedded in the soft flesh-coloured valet velvet, left the ma let lay the magnificent piece of jewellery which he had named. There are thirty-nine enormous barrels, said he, and the price of the gold chasing is in incalculable. Calculable. The lowest estimate would put the worth of of the coronet at double the sum which I have asked. I am prepared to leave it with you at my, as my security. I took the precious case into my hands and looked, at, looked in some perplexity from it to my illustrious client. You doubt its value? he asked. Not at all. I only doubt the propriety of me leaving it. You may set your mind at ease about that. I should not dream of doing so were it not absolutely certain that I would be able in four days to reclaim it. It is a pure matter of form. Is the security sufficient? Ample, you understand, Mr. Holder, that I am giving you a strong proof of the confidence which I have in you, founded upon all that I have heard of you. I rely upon you not only to be discreet and to refrain from all gossip about the matter, but, above all, to preserve this coronet with every possible precaution, because I need not say that a great public scandal would be caused if any harm were to befall it. Any injury to it would be almost as serious as its complete loss, for there are no barrels in the world to match these, and it would be impossible to replace them. I leave it with you, however, with every confidence, and I shall call for it in person on Monday morning. Seeing my, that my client was anxious to leave, I said no more, but calling for my cashier, I ordered him to pay over 50,000 50, pound notes. When I was alone once more, however, with the precious case lying upon the table in front of me, I could not help but think, with some misgivings, of the immense responsibility which it entailed upon me. There could be no doubt that... If it was a national possession, a horrible scandal would ensue if, if any misfortune should occur to it. I already regretted having ever consented to take charge of it. However, it was far too late to alter the matter now, so I locked it up in my private safe and turned once more to my work. When evening came, I felt that it would be, a be an imprudence to leave so precious a thing in the office behind me. Banker's safe has been, had been forced before now, and why should not, my, why should not mine be? If so, how terrible were the position in which I should find myself. I determined, therefore, that for the next few days I would always carry the case backwards and forwards with me, so that it may never really be out of my reach. With this intention, I called a cab and drove out to my house at Streatham, 
carrying the jewel with me. I did not breathe, breathe freely until I had taken it upstairs and locked it in the bureau of my dressing room. And now a word of my house, as to my household, Mr. Holmes, for I wish for you to be thir to thoroughly understand the situation. My groom and my page sleep out of the house and may be set aside altogether. I have three maid servants who have been with me a number of years and who, whose absolute reliability is quite above suspicion. Another, Lucy Parr, the second maid, waiting maid, has only been in my service a few months. She came with an excellent character, however, and has always given me satisfaction. She's a very pretty girl and has attracted admirers who have occasionally hung about her place. That's the only drawback which we have found to her, but we believe her to be a thoroughly good girl in every way. So much for the servants. My family itself is so small that it will not take me long to describe it. I'm a widower and have only one son, Harper. He has been a disappointment to me, Mr. Holmes, a grievous disappointment. I have no doubt that I myself am to blame. People tell me that I have spoiled him. Very likely I have. When my dear wife died, I felt that he was all that I had to love. I could not bear to see the smile fade even for a moment from his face. I have never denied him a wish. Perhaps it would have been better for both of us had I been sterner, but it, I meant it for the best. It was naturally my intention that he should succeed me in my business, but he was not a business, ma not a business man. He was wild, wayward, and to speak the truth, I could not trust him in the handling of large sums of money. When he was young, he became a member of an aristocratic club, and there, having charming manners, he was soon the intimate of, me of a number of men with large, pur long purses and expensive habits. He learned to play heavily at cards and to squander money on the turf until he had again and again come to me to implore to give him an advance upon his allowance that he may settle his debts of honour. He tried, more, he tried more than once to break away from the dangerous company which he was keeping, but each time the influence of his friend, Sir George Burnwell, was enough to draw him back there again. And indeed, I could not wonder that such a man as Sir George Burnwell should gain an influence over him, for he, he has frequently brought him to my house, and I have found myself that I could hardly resist the fascination of his manners. He is older than Arthur, a man of the world and his, a man of his world of the world to his fingertips, one who had been everywhere, seen everything, a brilliant talker, and a man of great personal beauty. Yet when I think of him in cold blood, far away from the glamour of his of his presence, I am convinced from his cynical speech and the look upon which I have caught in his eyes that he is one who should be deeply distrusted. So I think, and too thinks my little sis, thinks my little Mary who has a woman's instinct into character. And now there is only she to be described. She is my niece, but when my brother died five years ago and left her alone in the world, I adopted her, and have since looked upon her ever since as my own daughter. She is a sunbeam in my house, sweet, loving, beautiful, a wonderful manager and housekeeper, qu yet as tender and quiet and gentle as a woman could be. She is my right hand. I do not know what I would do without her. In only one matter she has ever gone against my wishes— Twice my boy has asked her to marry him, for he loves her devotedly, devotedly, but each time she has refused him. I think that if anyone could have drawn him into the right path, it would have been she, and that his marriage might have changed his whole life, but, alas, now it is too late, forever too late. Now, Mr. Holmes, you know the people who live in my ha under my roof, and I shall continue with my miserable story. When we were taking coffee in the drawing room that night after dinner, I told Arthur and Mary my experience, and of the precious treasure which we had under our roof, Suppressing, suppressing only the name of my client. Lucy Parr, who had brought in the coffee, had, I am sure, left the room, but I cannot swear that the room was closed. Mary and Arthur were very much interested and wished to see the famous coronet, but I thought it better not to disturb it. "'Where have you put it?' asked Arthur. "'In my own bureau.' "'Well, I hope to goodness the house won't be burgled during the night,' said he. "'It is locked up,' I answered. "'Oh, any old key will fit in that bureau. When I was a youngster, I have opened it myself with the key of the... Box room cupboard. He often had a wild way of talking, so that I, I thought little of what he said. He followed me to my room, however, that night with a very grave face. Look here, Dad, he said. Said he with his eyes cast down. Can you let me have two hundred pounds? No, I cannot. I answered sharply. I have been far too generous with you in money matters. You have been very kind, said he. But I must have this money, or else I can never show my face against inside the club again. And a very good to thing too, I cried. "'Yes, but you would not ha leave, have me leave it in leave it a dishonoured man,' said he. "'I could not bear the disgrace. "'I must raise the money in some way, "'and if you will not let me have it, "'then I must try other means.' "'I was very angry, for this was the third demand during the month. "'You shall not have a farthing from me,' I cried, "'on which he bowed and left the room without another word. "'When he was gone, I unlocked my bureau, "'made sure that my treasure was safe, and locked it again. "'Then I started to go round to the house to see that all was secure, 
a duty which I usually leave to Mary, but which I thought was well to perform myself that night. As I came down the stairs, I saw Mary herself at the side window of the hall, which she, was, she closed and fastened as I approached. "'Tell me, Dad,' she said, looking, I thought, a little disturbed. "'Did you tell Lucy, the maid, to leave to go out tonight?' "'Certainly not. She came in just now by the back door. I have no doubt that she was... she has only been to the side room gate to see someone, but I think that is hardly safe and should be stopped.' "'You must speak to her in the morning, or I will, if you prefer it. Are you sure that everything is fastened?' "'Quite sure, Dad. Then good night.' I kissed her and went up the bedroom again, which I soon, where I was soon asleep. "'I'm endeavouring to tell you everything, Mr. Holmes, which may have any bearing upon the case, but I beg that you will question me upon any point I do not make myself clear. "'On the contrary, your statement is singularly lucid.' "'I came to a part in my story now, I, got, I come to a part in my story now, which I should w wish to be particularly so. "'I am not a very heavy sleeper, and the anxiety in my mind tended, no doubt, to make me even less so than usual.' About two in the morning, then, I was awakened by some sound in the house. It had ceased ere I was awake. It had ceased ere I was wide awake, but it had left an impression behind as, it, as though a window had been gently closed somewhere. I lay listening with all my ears. Suddenly, to my horror, there was a distinct sound of footsteps moving softly in the next room. I slipped out of my room, my bed, all palpitating with fear, and peeped round the corner of my dressing room, ta dressing room door. Arthur! I screamed. You villain! You thief! How dare you touch that coronet? The gas was half up as I had left it, and my unhappy boy, dressed only in his shirt and trousers, was standing beside the light, holding the coronet in his hands. He had appeared to be—he appeared to be wrenching at it or bending it with all his strength. At my cry, he dropped it from his grasp and turned as pale as death. I snatched it—I shouted, snatched it back up and ex examined it. One of the gold corners with three of the barrels in it was missing. "'You blackguard!' I shouted myself, beside myself with rage. "'You have destroyed it! You have dishonored me forever! Where are the jewels which you have stolen?' "'Stolen!' he cried. "'Yes, thief!' I roared, shaking him by the shoulder. "'There are none missing! There cannot be any missing!' said he. "'There are three missing, and you know where they are. Must I call you a thief, a liar as well as a thief? Did I not see you trying to tear off another piece?' You have called me names enough, said he. I will not stand it any longer. I shall not say another word about this business since you have chosen to insult me. I will leave your house in the morning and make my own way in the world. You shall leave it in the hands of the police, I cried, half mad with grief and rage. I shall not. Ha I shall have this matter probed to the bottom. You shall learn nothing from me, he said with a passion such as I should not have thought was in his nature. If you choose to call the police, let the police find out what they can. By this time the whole house was astir, for I had raised my voice in my anger. Mary was the first to reach into my rush into my room, and at the sight of the coronet and of Arthur's face, she read the whole story, and with a scream fell down senseless on the floor, on the ground. I sent the housemaid for the police, and put the investigation into their hands at once. When the inspector and a constable entered the house, Arthur, who had stood, stood suddenly with his arms folded, asked me whether it was my intention to charge him with theft. I answered that it ceased to be a private matter, but had been a, become a public one, since the ruined coronet was national property. I was determined that the law should have its way in everything. At least, said he, you will not have me arrested at once. It would be to your advantage as well as mine if I leave this house for five minutes. That you may get away, or perhaps that you may conceal what you have stolen, said I. And then I realized the dreadful position in which I was placed. I implored him to remember that not only the sake of my honor, but that of one who was far greater than I was at stake, that he may have threatened to raise a scandal which would convulse the nation. He might avert it if he would just but tell me what he had done with the three missing stones. You may, as well, you may as well face the matter, said I. You have been caught in the act, and no confession could make your guilt any more heinous. If you but make reparation as to your power by telling us where the barrels all, all shall be forgiven and forgotten. Keep your forgiveness for those who ask for it, he answered, turning away from me in a sneer. I saw that he was too hardened for any words of mine to influence him. There was but one way for it. I called in the inspector and gave him into custody. A search was made at once, not only of his person, but of his room and of every portion of the house which he, where he could possibly have concealed the gems. But no trace of them could be found, nor would the wretched boy open his mouth for all our persuasions and our threats. This morning he was removed to a cell, and I, after going through all the police formalities, have hurried round to you to implore you to use your skill in unraveling the matter. The police have openly confessed to that they can present at present make nothing of it. You may go to any expense which you think is necessary. I have already offered a reward of a thousand pounds. My God, what shall I do? I have lost my honor, my gems, and my son in one night. Oh, what shall I do? 
He put his hand on either end of his head and rocked himself to and fro, droning on to himself like a child whose grief had gotten but beyond words. Sherlock Holmes sat silent for some minutes, with his brows knitted and his eyes fixed upon the fire. Do you, rec do you receive much company? he asked. None save my partner and his family, and an occasional friend of Arthur's. Sir George Br Burnwell has been several times lately. No one else, I think. Do you go out much into society? Arthur does. Mary and I stay home. We neither of us care for it. That is unusual in a young girl. She is of a quiet nature. Besides, she is not so young. She is four and twenty. This matter, from what you say, seems to have been a shock to her also. Terrible! She has been even more affected than I. You have neither of you any doubt as to your son's guilt. How can we have when we saw him with my own eyes with the coronet in his hand? I hardly consider that a conclusive proof. Was the remainder of the coronet at all injured? Yes, it was twisted. Do you not think that, that he might have been trying to straighten it? God bless you. You are doing what you can for him and for me, but it's too heavy a task. What was he doing there at all? If his purpose was innocent, why did he not say so? And precisely. And if he were guilty, why did he not invent a lie? His silence appears to me to cut both ways. There are several singular points about your case. What did the police think of when the noise think of the noise when you, which awoke you from your sleep? They considered that it might be Arthur closing his bedroom door. A likely story, as if a man bent on felony would slam his door as to wake a household. What do they say then of the disappearance of those gems? They are still search sounding the planking and probing the furniture in the hope of finding them. Have they thought to look outside the house? Yes, they have shown extraordinary energy. The whole garden has already been minutely examined. Now, my dear sir, said Holmes, it is not obvious to you now that this matter really strikes very much deeper than either you or the police were very first were first to think inclined. Is, is it not so obvious to you now that this matter really strikes very much deeper than either you or the police were at first inclined to think? It appeared to you to be a simple case. To me, it seems exceedingly complex. Consider what is involved by your theory. You suppose that your son came down from his bed, went, at great risk, to your dressing room, opened your bureau, took out your coronet, broke it off, broke off a main force of the small portion of it, went off in some other place, concealed three gems out of the thirty-nine, with such skill that nobody can find them, and then returned with the other thirty-six into the room in which he exposed himself to the greatest danger of being discovered. I ask you now, is such a theory tenable? But what other is there? cried the banker with a gesture of despair. If his motives were innocent, why does he not explain them? It is our task to find that out, replied Holmes. So now, if you please, Mr. H Mr. Holder, we will set off for, st for straight him together and devote an hour to glance a little more closely into details. My friend insisted upon accompanying them in their expedition, which I was eager enough to do for my... My friend insisted upon my accompanying them in their expedition, which I was eager enough to do, for my curiosity and sympathy were deeply stirred by the story in which I had been listening to. I confess that the guilt of the banker's son appeared to me to be as obvious as it did to the unhappy father, but still I had such great faith in Holmes's judgment that I felt that there must be some grounds for hope, as long as he was dissatisfied with the accepted explanation. He hardly spoke a word the whole way down to the southern suburb, but sat with his chin upon his breast and his hat drawn over his eyes, sunk in the deepest of thoughts. Our client appeared to have appeared to have taken fresh heart in the glimpse of hope which had been presented to him, and even broke into a desultory chat with me over his business affairs. A short railway journey to, in a shorter walk brought us to Fairbank, the modest residence of the great financer. Fairbank was a good-sized square house of white stone, standing back a little from the road, a double carriage sweep with a close, with a snow clad lawn stretched out stretched down in front of two large iron gates which closed the entrance. On the right side was a small wooden thicket which led into a narrow path between two neat hedges stretching from the road to the kitchen door and forming the tradesman entrance. On the left ran a lane which laid, led down to the stables and was not itself within the grounds at all, being a public though little used thoroughfare. Holmes left us standing at the door, and we walked slowly all round the house, across the front, down the tradesman's path, and so round by the garden, behind into the stable lane. So long was he that Mr. Holder and I went into the dining room and waited by the fire until he should return. We were sitting there in silence when the door opened and a young lady came in. She was rather about the middle height, slim, with dark hair and eyes, which seemed to be seem the darker against the absolute pallor of her skin. I do not think that I have ever seen such a deadly paleness in the woman's face. Her lips, too, were bloodless, but her eyes were flushed with crying. 
As she swept silently into the room, she impressed me with a great grief, greater sense of grief than the banker had done this morning. And it was all the more striking in her than she, as she was evidently a woman of strong character, with immense capacity for self-restraint. Disregarding my presence, she went straight to her uncle and passed his hand, passed her hand over his head with a sweet womanly caress. "'You have given orders that Arthur should be liberated, have you not, Dad?' she asked. "'No, my girl. No ma matter must be probed to the bottom. But I am so sure that he is innocent. You know what women's instincts are. I know that he has done no harm and that you will be sorry for acting so harshly. Why is he silent, then, if he is innocent?' "'Who knows? Perhaps because he was so angry that you should suspect him.' How could I help suspecting him when I actually saw him with the con coronet in his hand? Oh, but he had only picked it up to look at it. Oh, do, do take my word that he is innocent. Let the matter drop and say no more. It is so dreadful to think of our dear Arthur in prison. I shall never let it drop until the gems are fine, found. Never, Mary. Your affection for Arthur blinds you as to the awful consequences to me. Far from hushing the whole thing up, I have brought the gentleman down from London to inquire more about it. This gentleman, she asked, facing round to me. No, his friend. He wished us to leave him alone. He is round in the stable lane now. The stable lane? She raised her dark eyebrows. What can he hope to find there? Ah, this I suppose, ah, this I suppose is he. I trust, sir, that you will succeed in proving what I am sure is the truth, that my cousin Arthur is innocent of this crime. I fully share your opinion, and I trust with you that we may prove it, returned Holmes, back to the, going back to the mat to knock the snow from his shoes. I believe I have the honour of addressing Miss Mary Holder. May I ask you a question or two? Pray do, sir, if it may help you clear up this horrible affair. You heard nothing yourself last night? Nothing, until my uncle here began to speak loudly. I heard that, and then I came down. You shut up all the windows and doors the night before. Did you fasten all the windows? Yes. Were they fastened this morning? Yes. You have a maid who has a sweetheart. I think you remarked to your uncle last night that she had been out to see him. Yes, and she was the girl who waited at the drawing room and who may have heard Uncle's remarks about the coronet. I see. You infer that she might have gone to, out to tell her sweetheart and that the two might have plan, planned the robbery. But what is the good of all these vague theories? cried the banker impatiently. When I have told you that I saw Arthur with the coronet in his hands. Wait a little, wait a little, Mr. Holder. We must come back to that. About this girl, Miss Holder. You saw her return by the kitchen door, I presume. Yes, when I went to see if the door was fastened for the night, I met her slipping in. I saw the man, too, in the gloom. Did you know him? Oh, yes, he is the greengrocer who brings our vegetables around. His name is, his name is Francis Prosper. He stood, said Holmes, to the left of the door, that is to say, farther up the path that is necessary to reach the door. Yes, he did. And he is a man with a wooden leg. Something like fear sprang up in the young lady's expressive black eyes. Why, you are like a magician, said she. How do you know that? How do you know that? She smiled, but there was no answering smile in, our, in Holmes' thin, eager face. I should be glad now to go upstairs, said he. I shall probably wish to look over the outside of the house again. Perhaps I had better take a look at the lower, window, lower windows before I go up. He walked swiftly, he walked swiftly from one, of, well, one to the other, pausing only to the large one, which he looked from the hall onto the stable lane. This he, this he opened and made a very careful examination of the sill with his powerful magnifying lens. Now we shall go upstairs, he said at last. The banker's dressing room was plainly furnished little chamber with a, with a grey carpet, a large bureau, and a long mirror. Holmes went to the bureau first and looked hard at the lock. Which key was used to open it? He asked. That which my, that which my son himself indicated, that of the cupboard of the lumber room. Have you it here? That is on the dressing room. That is it, on the dressing room. Sherlock Holmes took it up and opened the bureau. It is a noiseless lock. It is a noiseless lock, said he. It is no wonder that it did not wake you. This case, I presume, contains the coronet. We must have a look at it. He opened the case, and taking out the di diadem, he, diadem, he laid it out upon the table. It was a magnificent specimen of the jeweler's art, and the thirty-six stones were the finest I had ever seen. At one side of the coronet was a cracked edge where a corner holding three gems had been torn away. Now, Mr. Holder, said Holmes, here is the corner which corresponds to which there has been so unfortunately lost. Might I beg that you would break it off? The banker recoiled in ho horror. I should not dream of trying, said he said. Then I will. Holmes suddenly bent his strength upon it, but without result. I feel it give a little, he said. But though I am exceptionally strong in the fingers, it, should not, it would not take me at all. It would, not, it would take all of my time to break it. 
An ordinary man could not do it. Now what do you think would happen if I did break it, Mr. Holder? There would be a noise like a pistol shot. Do you tell me that this all happened within a few yards of your bed and you heard nothing of it? I do not know what to think. It is all dark to me. But perhaps it might go lighter as we go. What do you think, Miss Holder? I confess that I still share my uncle's perplexity. Your son had no shoes or slippers on when you saw him. He had nothing on save that his own, save only his trousers and shirt. Thank you. We have certainly been favored with, with extraordinary luck during this inquiry, and it will be entirely our own fault if we do not succeed in clearing the matter up. With your permission, Mr. Holder, I shall now continue my investigations outside. He went alone at his own request, for he explained that any unnecessary footsteps might make his task more difficult. For an hour or more he was at work, returning at last with his feet heavy and snow, heavy with snow, and his features as inscrutable as ever. I think that I have now seen all there is to see, Mr. Holder, said he. I can serve you best by returning to my rooms. But the gems, Mr. Holmes, where are they? I cannot tell. The banker wrung his hands. I shall never see them again, he cried. And my son, you give me hopes? My opinion is no way altered. Then for God's sakes, what was this dark business which acted upon my house last night? If you can call upon me at Baker Street rooms tomorrow morning, between nine and ten, I shall be happy to do what I can to make it clear. I understand that you give me carte blanche to act for you, provide that only that I get back the gems and that you place no limit on the sum I might draw. I would give my fortune to have them back. Very good. I shall look into the matter before this then, before this, between this and then. Goodbye. It is just possible that I may have to come over here again before evening. It was obvious to me that my companion's mind was now made up about the case, though what about his conclusions were more than I could ever even dimly imagine. Several times during our homeward journey I endeavoured to sound him upon the point, but he always glided away to some other topic until at last I gave it over in despair. It was not yet three when we found ourselves in our rooms once more. He hurried to his chamber and was down again in a few minutes dressed in a common loafer. With his collar turned up, his shiny seedy coat, and his red cravat, and his worn boots, he was a perfect sample of the class. I think that this should do, he said, glancing at the gl glass above the fireplace. I only wish that you could come with me, Watson, but I fear that it won't do. I may be on the trail I may be on the trail in this matter, or I may be following a will-o'-wisp, but I shall know soon what which it is. I hope that I may be back in a few hours. He cut a slice of beef from the joint upon the sideboard, sandwiched it in between two rounds of beef bread, and thrust this rude meal into his pocket as he started off upon his expedition. I had just finished my tea when he, when he returned, evidently in excellent spirits, swinging an old elastic-sided boot in his hand. He chucked it down into a corner and helped himself to tea. I only, I only, I only looked in as I passed, he said, and I was going right on, and I am going right on. Where to? Oh, to the other side of the West End. It may be some time before I get back. Don't wait up for me in case I should be late. How are you getting on? Oh, so, so. Nothing to complain of. I have been out to Streadham since I saw you last, but I did not call at the house. It is a very sweet little problem, and I would not have missed it for a good deal. However, I must not sit gossiping here, but must get to these disreputable clothes off and return to my highly respectable self. I could see by his manner that he had stronger reasons for satisfaction than his words alone would imply. His eyes twinkled, and there was even a touch of colour upon his sallow cheeks. He hastened upstairs, and a few minutes later I heard the slam of the hall door, which told me that he was once off once more upon this conjugal hunt. I waited until midnight, but there was no sign of his return, so I retired to my room. It was not an uncommon thing for him to do to be away for days and nights on end when he was hot on upon a scent, so that his lateness caused me no surprise. I do not know at what hour he came in, but when I came down to breakfast in the morning, there he was, with a cup of fresh coffee in one hand and a paper in the other, as fresh and trim as possible. "'You will excuse my beginning without you, Watson,' said he, "'but you remember that my client has rather an early appointment this morning.' "'Why, it is after nine now,' I asked. "'I should not be surprised if that were he. I thought I heard a ring.' It was indeed our friend the financer. I was shocked by the change in which had come over him, for his face, which was naturally of a broad and massive mould, was now pinched and fallen in, while his hair seemed to be me at last at least a shade whiter. He entered with a weariness and lethargy, which was even more painful than his violence of the morning before, and he dropped heavily into the armchair, which I pushed forward to him. "'I do not know what I have done so to be so severely tired,' said he. "'Only two days ago I was happy and prosperous man without a care in the world.' Now I am left to a lonely and dishonoured age. Only one sorrow comes close upon the heel of another. My niece Mary has deserted me.
deserted you? Yes, her bed this morning has not been slept in, her room was empty, and a note for me lay in the hall table. I had said to her last night in sorrow, and not in anger, that if she, were, if she had married my boy, all might have been well with him. Perhaps it was thoughtless of me to say it. It is to say, it is that my rem that remark that she refers to in this note. My dearest uncle, I fear that I have brought trouble upon you, and that if I had acted differently, this terrible misfortune might never have occurred. I cannot view this thought, I cannot with this thought in my mind ever be happy under your roof, ever again be happy under your roof, and I fear that I must leave you forever. Do not worry about my future, for that is provided for, and above all, do not search for me, for it will be fruitless labor and, Ill, and an ill service to me. In life or death, I am ever your loving Mary. What could she mean by that note, Mr. Holmes? Do you think it points to suicide? No, no, nothing of the kind. It is perhaps the best solution I trust, Mr. Ho Mr. Holder, that you are nearing the end of your troubles. Ha! You say so. You have heard something, Mr. Holmes, and have learned something. Where are the gems? You would not think a thousand of pence an ex excessive sum for them? I would pay ten. That will be unnecessary. Three thousand will cover the matter. And here is a little reward, I fancy. And there is a little... There is, and there is a little reward, I fancy. Have you your checkbook? Here is a pen, but to make it out for four thousand. With a dazed face, the banker made out the required check. Holmes walked over to his desk and took out a little triangular piece of gold with three gems in it and threw it upon the table. With a shriek of joy, our client clutched it up. You have it, he gasped. I am saved. I am saved. The reaction of joy was as passionate as his grief had been, and he hugged his recovered gems to his bosom. There is one other, th there is one other thing you owe me, Mister Holder," said Sherlock Holmes rather sternly. "Oh!" he caught up a pen. "Name the sum, and I will pay it." "No, the debt is not to me. You owe a very humble apology to that noble lad, your son, who had carried himself in this matter as I should be proud to call my own son should I ever have the chance to have one." "Then, it was not Arthur who took them." I told you yesterday, and I repeat today, that it was not. You are sure of it. Then let us hurry at him, to him at once, and let him know that the truth is known. He knows it already. When I cleared it all up, I had an interview with him, and finding that he would not tell me the story, I told it to him, on which he had to confess that I was right, and to add the very few details with which were not yet quite clear to me. Your news of this morning, however, may open his lips. For heaven's sake, tell me, then, what is this extraordinary mystery? I will do so, and I will show you the steps in which I reached it, and let me say to you first that which is hardest for me to say and for you to hear. There has been an understanding between Sir George Burnwell and your niece Mary. They have now fled together. My Mary! Impossible! It is unfortunately more than possible. It is certain. Neither you nor your son knew the true character of this man when you admitted him into your family circle. He is one of the most dangerous men in England. A ruined gambler, an absolute desperate villain, a man without heart or conscience. Your, why, your niece knew nothing of such men. When he breathed his vows to her, as he had done to a hundred before her, she flattered, she flattered herself that she alone had touched his heart. The devil knows best what he said, but at best she became his tool and was in the habit of seeing him nearly every evening. I cannot, and I will not believe it, cried the banker with an ashen face. I will tell you then what occurred in your house last night. Your niece, when you had, as she thought, gone to your room, slipped down and talked to her lover through the window, which leads into the stable lane. His footmarks had pressed right through the snow so long as he had stood there. She told him of the coronet. His wicked lust for gold kindled at the news, and he bent her to his will. I have no doubt that she loved you, but there are women in whom the love of a lover ex extinguishes all other loves, and I think she must have been one. She had hardly listened to his instructions when she saw you coming downstairs, on which she closed the window rapidly and told you about one of the servants' escapade with his with her wooden-legged lover, which was all perfectly true. Your boy Arthur went to bed after his interview with you, but he slept badly on account of his uneasiness about his club's debt. In the middle of the night he heard a soft tread pass his door, so he rose and looked out was to, and was surprised to see his cousin walking very stealthily along the passage, until she disappeared into your dressing room. Petrified with astonishment, the lad slipped on some clothing and waited there in the dark to see what would come of the strange affair. Presently, she, em she emerged from the room again in the light of the and in the light of the passage lamp, your son saw that she carried the precious coronet in her hands. She passed down the stairs, and he, thrilling with honour, ran along and slipped behind the curtain near your door, whence he could see what passed in the hall beneath. He saw her steadily open the door, head out to the head head a hand out the coronet to someone in the gloom 
and then closing it once more, hurried back to her room, passing quite close to where he stood hid behind the curtain. As long as she was on the scene, he could not take any action without, an ex without a horrible exposure of the woman he loved. But the instant that she was gone, he realized how crushing, rushing a misfortune this would be for you, and how all-important it would be to set it right. He rushed down just as he was in his bare feet, opened the window, sprang out into the snow, and ran down the lane where he could see a dark figure in the moonlight. Sir George Burnwell tried to get away, but Arthur caught him, and there was a struggle between them, your lad tugging at one side of the coronet and his opponent at the other. In the scuffle, your son struck Sir George and cut him over the eye. Then something suddenly snapped, and your son, finding that he had the coronet in his hands, rushed back, closed the window, and ascended to your room. Had, and he had just observed that the coronet had been twisted in the struggle and was endeavouring to straighten it when you appeared upon the scene. Is it possible? Gasped the, gasped the banker. You then roused his anger by calling him names at a moment when he felt that he, he deserved your warmest thanks. He could not explain the true state of affairs without ba betraying one who was certainly deserved little, little enough consideration. One who certainly deserved little enough consideration at his hands. He took the more chivalrous view, however, and preserved his secret. And that is why she shrieked and fainted when she saw the coronet," cried Mister Holder. "Oh my God! What a blind fool I have been! In his asking to be allowed to go out for five minutes, the dear fellow wanted to see if the missing piece were at the scene of the struggle. How cruelly I have misjudged him!" When I arrived at the house, continued Holmes, I at once went. I at once went very carefully round to observe it, round it to observe if there were any traces in the snow which might help me. I knew that none had fallen since the evening before, and, and also that there had been a strong frost to preserve impressions. I passed along the tradesman path, but found it all trampled down and indistinguishable. Just beyond it, however, at the far side of the kitchen door, a woman had stood and talked with a man whose round impressions could, on one side, show that he had a wooden leg. I could even tell that they had been disturbed, for the woman had run back swiftly to the door and was, sho was shown by the deep toe and light heel marks, while wooden leg had waited a little and then gone away. I thought at the time that this might have been made in his sweetheart, of whom you had already spoken to me, and inquiry showed it to be so. I passed, I passed round the garden without seeing anything more than random tracks, when, which I took to the police, but when I got back to the stable lane, a very long and complex story was written in the story in the snow in front of me. There was a double line of tracks of a booted man, and a second double line, which I saw with delight, belonged to a man which stood with naked feet. I was at once convinced, from what you had told me, that the latter was your son. The first had walked both ways, but the other had run swiftly, and his tread was marked in places over the depression of the boot. It was obvious that he had passed after the other. I followed them up and found that they lay, led to the hall, wi win hall window where Boots had worn all the snow away while waiting. Then I walked to the other end, which was a hundred yards or more down the lane. I saw where Boots had faced round, where the snow was cut up as though there had been a struggle, and finally where a few drops of blood had fallen to show that I was not mistaken. Boots had then run down the lane, and another little smudge of blood showed that it was he who had been hurt. When he came to the high road on the other end, I found that the pavement had been cleared, and so there was an end to that clue. On entering the house, however, I examined, as you remember, the sill and framework of the hall window with my lens, and I could at once see that someone had passed out. I could distinguish the outline of an instep where the wet foot had been placed in coming in. I was then beginning to, able, I was then beginning to be able to form an opinion as to what had occurred. A man had been waiting outside the window, someone who had brought the gems, the deed brought the gems. The deed had been overseen by your son. He had pursued the thief, had struggled with him. They had tugged at the coronet, their united strength causing injuries with, with, which neither alone could have effected. He had returned with the prize, but had left a fragment in the grasp of his opponent. So far as I was clear, so far I was clear. The that question now was, who was the man and who was it that brought him the coronet? It is an old maxim of mine that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however impossible, probable, must be the truth. Now I know that it was not you who had brought it down, so there was only remained your niece and the maids. But if it were the maids, why should your son allow himself to be ac accused in their place? There could be no possible reason. As he loved his cousin, however, there was an excellent explanation as why he would retain her secret, the more so the, as the secret was a disgraceful one. When I remembered that I had seen her at the window, and how she had fainted upon seeing the coronet again, my conjecture became a certainty. And who, and who could it be who was her confidant? A lover, evidently, for who else could outweigh the love and gratitude which she might feel towards you? I know that you went out little, and that your circle of friends was a very limited one, but along them was Sir George Burnwell. I had heard him of him before as a man of evil reputation among women. It must have been he who bore the boots and retained the missing gems. 
Even though he knew that Arthur had discovered him, he might still flatter himself that he was safe, for the lad could not say a word without compromising his own family. Well, your own good sense will... Well, your own good sense will suggest which measures I took up next. I went in the shape of a loafer to Sir George's house, managed to pick up an acquaintance with his valet, learned that his master had cut his head the night before, and finally, at the expense of six, six shillings, made all sure by buying a pair of his cast-off shoes. With these, I journeyed down to the Steatham and saw that they exactly fitted the tracks. I saw an ill vagabond in the lane yesterday evening, said Mr. Holder. Precisely. It was I. I found that I had my man, so I came home and changed my clothes. It was a delicate part which I had had to play then, for I saw that a uh, prosecution must be avoided to avert scandal, and I knew and I knew that so astute a villain would see that our hands were tied over the matter. I went and saw him. At first, of course, he denied everything, but when I gave him every particular that had occurred, he tried to bluster and took down a life preserver from the wall. I knew my man, however, and I cla clapped a pistol to his head before he could strike. Then he became a little more reasonable, and I told him that we would give him a price for those stones he held. A thousand, a thousand pounds apiece. That brought out the first signs of grief that he had shown. Why, dash it all, said he. I've let them go at six hundred for the three. I soon managed to get the address of the receiver of who, I ha who had them, on promising him that he, there would be no prosecution. Off I set to him, and after much chaff chaffering, I got our stones at a thousand pounds apiece. Then I looked in upon your son, told him that all was right, and evidently got my bed, got to my bed about two o'clock, after which I may call a really hard day's work. A day which has served, saved England from a great public scandal, said the banker, rising. Sir, I cannot find words to thank you, but you shall not find me ungrateful for what you have done. Your skill has indeed in ex exceeded all that I have heard, and now I must fly to my dear boy to apologize to him for the wrong which I have done him. And what do you think? And to what you, and to what you can tell me of poor Mary, it goes to my very heart. Not even your skill can inform me where she is now. I think we may safely say, returned Holmes, that she is wherever Sir George Burnwell is. It is equally certain too that wherever whatever her sins are, they will soon receive a more than sufficient punishment. Thank you, gentle listeners, for joining me today. Tune in next time for the final installment of this particular anthology, but we're not done yet, folks. There's more to come. Come back soon. Be well. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>